I'll be uh, providing you with an explanation. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Swain. The purpose of this video is to share an explanation of the six different lessons that you have included in your geometry packet, uh, advanced geometry for summer school. So I will be uh, recording. Okay. There we go. Okay. I have uh, provided a, a set here so that you can see the lessons. You'll notice that the, the cover sheet has instructions on how to how to get help with your lessons, uh, whom to call, uh, what to include, of course, on your cover sheet packet when you turn it in. Don't uh, you want to turn everything in and show as much of your work as possible? Uh, you'll also see that you um, have drop-off times for your work, Mondays through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the ninth grade center entrance on the corner of West Houston Street and North 31st Street. All the packets are due no later than 4 p.m. on June 24th, so be sure you budget your time accordingly. There's a phone number for you to reach someone if you uh, can't get hold of your advisor teacher during school hours. Okay, so you also, um, in your packet, you have a formula reference chart for geometry. Uh, the, the formulas that you'll be using have to do with surface area and volume. So starting right here, surface area, of course, includes the total area of all the sides of a 3D figure. So notice that this is a 3D prism. Prism is a 3D. 3D. For surface area, you're going to get the area of each of the faces of this figure, 3D figure. But notice that its base is a triangle. You, it, the tr base is not always the side that the figure rests on, although it does in this case. The base could be um, on this, uh, it could be like this. And the base would be the two ends that are congruent. So be sure you're using the right base to get the area of when you're dealing with surface area. But you notice that you've got a volume and uh, a lateral area and a surface area formula for most of the 3D figures. So the 3D figures now go down to uh, including sphere and hemisphere. We won't be doing any uh, wedges or, or uh, section area. Okay, so then you start your lesson with number one, the surface area of 3D figures. Please notice, and I'm going to highlight this, use pi equal to 3.14 and always round to the nearest hundred. Two, two decimal places. So in each of these lessons, you'll be given some notes. The formula is included here as well as on your formula chart. And then some examples for you to complete. And so you'll be using those formulas and be sure once again that you notice where the, the base of your figure is. It's not always sitting on the base as it is in number three. Sometimes it's on the ends. So in section one, you'll be doing the surface area of prisms, cylinders, pyramids and cones, and finally spheres. And you have some examples for each one. And in lesson two, we're moving on to volume of the same figures, the same 3D figures. And once again, you will be given the formulas that you need, not only on the reference chart, but in the uh, middle of the notes. So here you're given two examples, one where you have a regular pr uh, prism, uh, quite a rectangular prism, and then one that's slanted. When it's slanted, you're still looking for the height, the perpendicular height. So we're going to calculate volume in each of these. So we're going to multiply the dimensions together. For volume of cylinder, there you have your formula. And for volume of a cone and a pyramid, cone is right up here. Up there. 
So um, section two, just follow the formula, use the, uh, the dimensions that are provided on the practice problems. Then you'll have a mixed practice in which you find the volume of each of these first few figures. And then we're going to move to scale factor. A scale factor deals with perimeter, area, and volume. Perimeter is one dimensional, area is two dimensional, and volume is three dimensional. And that's, in, uh, that's critical to remember because for scale factor, for perimeter, we're going to multiply just by the scale factor of three. But for area, we multiply by the scale factor squared. And then when we get to volume later, you got it, you're going to multiply by the scale factor cubed. So you start out with the scale factor on perimeter and area and move through those problems. And then changing dimensions for surface area, for volume. So for surface area, remember, it's going to be the scale factor, whatever that is, squared. And for volume, it will be the scale factor cubed. So you'll take the original set, uh, surface area. If the dimensions are doubled, then you're going to multiply this, the original surface area times 2 squared. Okay. For volume, you're going to multiply the original uh, volume by 4 cubed. All right. Uh, the fourth lesson now moves back to the theoretical mathematics that we use in geometry, probability. And you first look at sample spaces. So you have some, some basic vocabulary. Element of a set is what's contained within the set. The empty set has no elements because there's nothing that meets the requirements of that set. The description of the set is going to be a collection of distinct objects called the elements. A subset is a set within a set. So if I have all even numbers, then a subset of that would be 2, 4, 6, and 8. And that subset goes between elements 2 and 8. So uh, if you start out with all evens. Okay. So the universal set is a complete collection of elements, and the theoretical probability is always the number of outcomes for the event, number of possible outcomes for the event, divided by, um, no, the number of possible outcomes for the event we're interested in, divided by the total in the universal set. Sorry, that line is kind of obscuring your sight on that one. So then you're given some examples, and then you're given some multiple choice uh, items in your assignment. And uh, remember that when you count the uh, distinct elements in a set, that you're looking for a number. But when you're listing this, the elements in a set, you're looking for a number, and look at this one, it's number nine, of the item, the choices, one red marble, two green marbles, three choices altogether, times the number of times you're gonna to, uh, choose. So here we choose one marble for myself, and one from my friend. So I'm going to multiply the choices that I have um, to uh, the choices I have times the number of choices my friend then has. And if I start out with three and I choose one, remember that I'm only going to have two. I have three choices for me, but once I keep one, my friend only has two choices. So you've got to pick one that has six items one, two, three, four, five, six. So some of these are just logic, not much mathematics, although mathematics is a certainly a set, uh, system of logic. So let's move on to the next one. Permutations and combinations is lesson five. And here you have some definitions of permutations where order does matter. So if I have 30 students playing Kahoot, three prizes for second and third. It matters which one is, comes in first. If one comes in first, that person cannot be second or third. And so we have 30 to begin with, and that tells us that I have 30 times 29 times 28 possible permutations where order matters, and that will be my answer. For combinations, however, order doesn't matter. So that means that 
one, two, three is the same subset as two, three, one. So for combinations, we're gonna have fewer possible. We start out with the same number, 30, but uh, 30, ooh, that's awful. 30 times 29 times 28, just like we did with permutations. However, we have to divide out the possible order changes. And that's going to be whatever the smaller number is factorial. So that means we start with the number and then the numbers that came before it, two and one. So we're gonna take this product and then divide out three times two times one. Okay, now you once you get the idea of how to tell the difference in a permutation and combination, you are going to use this website as a calculator for permutations and calculations. You'll just have to put in the N, which is the total amount of items, and then R, which is the smaller number or the subset. All right, we're at section uh, lesson six, and lesson six has independent and dependent of, uh, events. This is a very simple distinction. Uh, independent events are, refer to a sequence of events in which Subsequent events have no, uh, the early events have no influence over the outcome of the subsequent events. So if I want A and B to happen, if A happens, B can have the same probability. There's no difference in the probabilities. But if they are dependent events, that means whatever happens in the first event in the sequence will influence the availability of outcomes for the second event and third event and so on. So um, you're given an example. Uh, it is explained down here that when you have multiple events, the probability of each event gets multiplied together. You just have to decide, is this a dependent event where I do not replace the result of the first or second or third uh, events in the sequence or an independent of, uh, event where I do replace the original uh, earlier events into the bag so that they are still possible outcomes for subsequent events. I hope you enjoy your packet. Once again, if you have any questions, please contact your advisor teacher and um, uh, enjoy and have a great summer.